What do you love about being outside and active? I'm, I'm sure I've spent more time outdoors than in. That just feels like home. Enjoy what you can do because you never know what is around the corner. Just being outdoors in the fresh air, it just clears my mind. Fully immersed in nature is what brings me the most joy. Hello and welcome back to the Outside and Active podcast. I'm currently recording this intro at the London Snow Show where I've been recording podcasts with some amazing people over the weekend, including today's guest, Neil Nine Lives Campbell. Now you'll find out in this episode why Neil has the nickname Nine Lives. Um, a really interesting conversation with someone who growing up in Luton at the age of 15 to 20 years old, never thought that he would be up on the mountains and the snowboarding industry and world, um, especially when he got sent to prison at the age of 19, which sort of started the trajectory to a different life of where he finds himself now. He gives all of his background in the episode and it's really interesting hearing his experiences and why he's so grateful for snowboarding for saving his life. But just before we jump into the episode with Neil, I want to ask a quick favour from each of you that's either listening or watching this podcast. If each of you takes just two seconds to forward this episode onto someone who you think that would enjoy it just as much as you, then we can continue growing this outside and active community. That's all from me. Let's head straight into this week's episode with my guest, Neil Campbell. Neil, I'm going to kick off by offering you a piece of advice. And this piece of advice comes from someone who's come onto the podcast quite recently, Warren Smith. Yep. And his advice is, if you're going down a new run or a new location, then do your research. So that's his advice. And I guess the question leading on from that is, do you take health and safety precautions when you're gonna, doing what you do? I was going to say, that's like <laughs> hella safe. That's so sensible. I think uh, I know the answer. Yeah, I just I don't know about that. <laughs> maybe look before you leap, but, but as far um, as the runs go, man. Vomit. I tell you what, <laughs> I said to this to my friends once. Um, <clears throat> we were going somewhere that we weren't sure about. And someone was like, are you sure? Should we go? I said, look, if we all go and we have to walk out, at least we all have to walk out. <laughs> and I think I live by that statement. We go together, you know, born and die together. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, in, in, in the film, which we're going to chat about that you've done with Adidas, Terex, which is which is awesome. The faces of the people that you're that you're with, your friends, are just going. I just don't know how he does that and still lands on his feet. It just looks like about to go over, and then, well, I guess that's the reason that, that the nickname Nine Lives came uh, came about from as well. But um, before we chat about that, there's another question that I ask to everyone: What do you love about being outside and active? It's purposefully vague. Um. I mean, everybody probably says freedom, but I mean, yeah, freedom is one of them. But I think the best thing about being outside is that you're not inside. Because <laughs> inside, you're just so confined. I mean, like where we are now, we've got beautiful backdrops. All I can think about doing is swimming under that bridge or... You know, diving in that ocean. Outside is just the place to be. Definitely. I wish we could just take this outside. Yeah, <laughs> be a bit colder yeah, and maybe yeah. raining. Oh, but even then, <laughs> if we took this outside, it, it would introduce the elements of the public and everybody walking past. And yeah. it makes it just brings another dimension. Do you know what I mean? And I, I'm, I'm that social kind of outside kind of person. Definitely. Well, what was Luton like growing up? Because is is there much of an outdoors na natural kind of area on your doorstep there? Yeah, well, yes. Where I lived, I live um, on the on the edge of Luton. So you head out one way, and it's countryside. Mm. You head the other way, and it's the town centre sort of thing. So yeah, well, we're always on the edge of countryside. There's always like walks you could go on, places to go. If you were that way inclined. Yeah. Or you just go down the local town centre like you do, would in most towns, you know, and hang out outside Poundland or whatever. And hang out for the day, causing trouble at McDonald's, you know. But, yeah, we did, when I was really young, we'd get on our bikes and try and ride to Bedford or something, you know, the next town along, which is like 15 miles away, and just have adventures like that, yeah. But could you have imagined at that age kind of where you would be now and the adventures 
that you go on now and the and being on top of mountains ready to go down runs could you have imagined it at at that age in Luton no definitely not um I I didn't know what like skiing or snowboarding even was do you know what I mean like mm. if I was lucky if I caught it on on one of the television shows or I mean, Bored Stupid was a little bit before my time. I heard about that afterwards. So I kind of didn't even see that, you know. Like, I would have had to be in watching Eurosport or something yeah. and got the curling or, you know, to really even be introduced to that side of life. We played a lot of football like we do in the cities. We played a lot of basketball. I even played rugby and tennis. Like, every sport that was introduced to me, I would have a go at it, definitely. So, I mean, if I was, I could imagine trying it if somebody had been in a position to introduce it to me, but it just wasn't even. On your radar at all? Not at all. Not but at all. it seemed like your life was going a certain trajectory and changed at the age of 19. Can you tell me a little bit around, a bit of, of that, around that time? Yeah, sure. So, like, it's a pretty common knowledge. I went to prison when I was 19. And um, a result of, going to prison I was in the middle of a court case so I went to I went to prison on remand then I was allowed out I was let out um, and in that in between time I wasn't allowed to Luton so oh, right yeah it was on my condition that I wasn't allowed to go back to the place where whatever had everything happened. had happened yeah yeah so um, I moved to Milton Keynes where my aunt lived and I stayed stayed with her for a few months and she was pretty strict. She said to me, you can stay, no problem, but you have to get a job. So I went looking for a job. It took me about a month or so, handed my CV out to a thousand places. I got one response, the snow dome. Wow. Literally. One response back, and it was from them. I, I would have taken any job yeah. I needed to work. <clears throat> but it's like I said on stage not too long ago, I could have, I would have easily t took a job at Top Man or... A retail job or any, any job. Something that came back to you. Whatever came yeah. back. But they were they were the ones that came back. The only reply I got was from them. And the guy at the time, I think Michael Dickinson, something. The manager at the time, he loved me. Like we got on like a house on fire instantly. He gave me a job straight away. <laughs> and, and that was it. The rest is history. I started working there. Got introduced to snowboarding reluctantly <laughs> didn't really want to do it even though I was working there I was going to say when you were kind of starting to work there did you just see it as a job you kind of the what events were taking place around you was sort of just 100% I, I took no interest in what was going on in that building none my job at the time was to a customer would come I'd sell them a ticket for a lesson or for tobogganing or for whatever they were doing that day that'd be it they'd get the ticket off me and then that was it I didn't even <laughs> take an interest in what was going on down there you know, it was freezing cold. I, w I just had no interest. Until one day, one of the ski instructors told me I should have a go, basically. He goes, I've got no lesson. No one's turned up. Come on, You're on go. lunch. Let's try. I was like, oh, really? Yeah, come on. It'll be fun. All right, let's go. Let's try it. And I did. I did two hours that day, two hours the next day, and then that was it. Hooked. Is this it. skiing? That was snowboarding. Oh, that was snowboarding. Yeah, straight into time. snowboarding. Yeah. Did, was it just whatever well, felt if, right at that if time? If a ski instructor had come up to me and asked me to try skiing, I probably would have done that. Yeah. It was just because it was it was what it was. He had a free snowboard lesson. I had not much to do. He knew I worked there. Come on, you don't snowboard yet. You work here. You might as well try. And yeah, it went, it went just like that. <laughs> so was it like a gradual thing that you fell in love with or... Was it almost seen by force that people were like, come on, no, go down yeah. again? Or if you've got a spare 10 minutes, then, oh, fine, I'll just go. It's something do you know to what? do. The, first, the initial lesson felt a bit forced. Yeah. Because I really didn't have an interest. Yeah. And then I, being on the slope and seeing what goes on on the slope, I've, I mean, my second lesson, I think, was in an e one evening and there was a park out on the main slope. So while I'm learning to like put a turn together... I can see the guys on the right-hand side doing jumps, rails, backflips, you know, like having a great time. Music, they had music on. It wasn't normally loud music on yeah. during the day, you know. And I thought, yeah, that looks... It's quite a good energy. Good, yeah, good energy, good fun, good atmosphere. 
And the guys, they were loving it. Like, they were having a great time. And um, so I, I must have just got to a point where I could do snowboard and I could link my terms. I mean, it wasn't great. I could link my terms and maybe I could turn around and do a little bit switch. And then I thought, those guys are doing some real cool stuff. I want to move over there and, and try that. And I got obviously working now, I got introduced to a lot of the local kids yeah. and I'd see them every getting dropped off by their parents, you know, to go snowboarding on a Thursday or a Friday. And at that time, we didn't even really have a great park infrastructure. So a lot of the kids who snowboard there, they would come early and build stuff yeah. to go riding on. And I just thought that was brilliant. Like these youngsters getting dropped off by their parents, like they pay, I don't know, 20 or 30 quid. Some of them were sponsored, so they were allowed for free. And they'd come in, build the cell little park, ride it, film each other, and then by the next week or the week after, you'd see it online. Like There's some great they were footage just doing, in there. Yeah, they were yeah. just doing their thing. And I was hooked by it. I just thought, this is the best thing I've ever seen. And I was a bit older than them, so it wasn't... I was... To be this early 20s still yeah, around that like time. Yeah, I was like 20, 21, and yeah. I was like super excited, like wishing I'd done it beforehand, watching them do all these crazy tricks, not realising that they'd learn <laughs> loads more tricks before these. Like, this is like what they were doing to impress other yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. This is their progression. And I just jumped in. I was like, right, so I've got to do that, yeah? And they're like, well, yeah, if you can. And it turns out some things I could just do. And it, I just took it from there. Just jumping in at this point in the podcast with Neil to tell you a little bit about Tyrol because if you are listening to this thinking, oh, I haven't been skiing or snowboarding for a while and I don't know where to look, then have a look at Tyrol to book your next skiing adventure, whether it's one of their many resorts such as Innsbruck, Gurgel, Alberg, Ischgl, Skijual, Zillatal, any one of those six, then have a look. Maybe your next adventure is around the corner. Now, there's six different resorts to go and look at and choose from, and you can read all about those resorts and the link to go and explore more in the podcast description. If you're listening on YouTube, then there'll be some more information there. And also on the outsideandactive.com website in the article related to this podcast, you can find out more about the Tyrol resorts there. Get ready for your next skiing adventure with Tyrol. But unorthodox was the word that it's yeah. kind of used quite a lot. <laughs> Can you explain a bit more about that? Yeah, so um, because I didn't have that baseline skill, I mean, I I think the first trick I learned was front board. And everyone did 50-50 first, or board slide. or And I, I just did what I felt comfortable Natural. doing. Yeah, yeah, like I didn't have that thing of... Right, this is step one, and that's step five, and to get there, you got to work two, two, three, and four. I just saw step five as step one. And I'm like, oh, you did switch back one on. <laughs> I can do switch a little bit. Maybe it'll feel better if I do that and ride off normal. And then I did, and then that was like my trick. Those guys are like, you can't do front, you can't do board slide, but you can do switch back one. What's going on? I'm like, no idea. Oh, okay, but this is what I'm <laughs> going <good>. with. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, literally. And, and that was my progression. I'd just see... I mean, five years in, I didn't even know what the names of the tricks were. I would just used to it's do... Visual. You yeah, just go, like, oh, I can that. do that. Yeah, yeah. and somebody would say, oh, what's, what's your favourite trick? Or what are you going to do next? And I'd be like, you know where you go on your front foot and you come on... They're like, what? Like, yeah, I don't know what it's called. And I'll just do it. <laughs> and that, and I'll that, just show you instead. Yeah, it was, that was like <laughs> a running joke. I didn't know anything about snowboarding. And I just... I, but I enjoyed it and I loved it and I wanted to try everything. And is that sort of the time where the nickname kind of yeah, started to so stick? The, the name kind of didn't come until I started doing trips. Because when I started doing trips, obviously, the consequences are a lot greater. Yeah. <laughs> In the snow dome, I was like, that's my, I felt like that was my home. Safety net. It sounds pretty morbid, but the, the hospital was like five, four mile away. I knew that. An ambulance <laughs> to here to get me there. It's not going to be that long. But when you're going on trips. Yeah, when you're abroad <laughs> in France or in Austria, or, then it's like, okay, if I mess it up here, then it's... Not just around the corner. Up. It's mm -hmm. You know, you've got insurances. It's like a lot more to think about. Yeah. So while I was riding in England, I was like so blasé because I was just like, well, 
Yeah, What's caution the worst to the wind. That can happen? Yeah. They'll come and sweep me up off the slope, <laughs> take me to the hospital if I need <laughs> And it. you'll be back the next and day. And I'll be back, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was me when I was abroad, you know. I was, like, not really knowing terrain, not really knowing, like, go slow because you know what's after that hill you should look before you... I, I just didn't know any of that stuff, so... Not taking Warren's advice of being... Not <laughs> taking <laughs> Warren's <laughs> advice, literally, yeah, but... I, I mean, I came up with people like Henry Jackson, and Henry, one of my best mates in snowboard, and he is, he's one of those people that egg you on. Yeah. Henry loves to see, come on, you can do it, Neil, what are you even talking about? Yeah, you're right, let's go. And go on then. Like, Watch this. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> Get the camera me, out. Pushing me, yeah. But that taught me so many things, and so, like he took me into so many different, like I took me, I followed him, like he had, he was doing a lot of speaking work, and. I'd find out where he was and I'd be like, yeah, Henry, I've got a week, can I come? And he'd be like, yeah, sweet, come over to Dachstein or come over to wherever. And I'd just go and hang out with him, meet all the people that he knew in the industry and be like that hanger on and be like, yeah, can I'll come. Like somebody's going on a run, who wants to go up there? Y- Any yeah, opportunity. Me, I'll come. Yeah. yeah, and I was that guy. And um, Henry was the one who kind of gave me the name because, I mean, he's seen everything in snowboarding. Now he's like emceeing in the biggest competitions the Olympics, you know, he's seen it all. He knows what good snowboarding is. He knows what bad snowboarding is. He's been like, not a judge, but he's seen it. And um, he was that guy that gave me a lot of encouragement in the early days. And it's nice to have someone in the community that can yeah. put their arm around you and you Somebody can go Somebody who's to. really well known as yeah. well. Yeah. Especially when you're new to it. But was that community... Well, welcomed you in with open arms. Yeah, I was. Ex- it it, it yeah. was. It was really nice. Everybody I met throughout, especially traveling with Henry and going places with him, he'd always introduce me as Nine Lives. This is my friend from England. He's mental. You know, like <laughs> <laughs> hi, that's me. <laughs> yeah. But it was great because it, it was super accepted by everybody. There, there wasn't. I, I really don't remember having like a, a bad experience in that kind of bubble that was like freestyle world the snowboarding community that so was you, always great you start to build up those connections in your it becomes m- part of your life more but then when does it start to kind of the door open towards working with brands such as adas terex like yeah how does that start to come about so you fly, when we were riding on the, in indoors there was always a competition brand was always putting on an event like it was really really active at that time yeah and um i think my first i was in a burton event back in the day and i i think i won one of the stops or i got best trick i got something at one of the stops they had an event at milton Keynes, burton i can't remember if it was black metal or one of their series of events that they used to run they go to all the domes they'd have a winner and a best trick and what they were doing at that time is they had um, a place out in Austria where they planned wh- whoever won at all the stops, they'd all go to Austria and they'd do a trip from there. They'd do a trip to there, film it, whatever, or whatever, yeah. whatever. Turns out I got a spot on that trip along with a load of the other guys from that time. And yeah, it was like my introduction to traveling going away as a as a group with like a pro company and just a, it was a glimpse into that life you know doing season living away and that kind of all turned it around for me I thought being inside's great working on this indoor slope and that's obviously where I learned that was the inception yeah into I, the I, I honed my whatever skills I had there at that time but that was it was when I realized there was a world of opportunities outside <laughs> of the indoor slope, which sounds like crazy because obviously riding mountains and skiing and snowboarding has never been inside. It's always been yeah. in the mountains. But, but you'd known it as... i just known zone. it as a mm. indoor thing at the snow zone until I really saw what was going on. And yeah, that was my introduction. So then how did the film come about? Uh, so the film that we made, it just... So my full snow like snowboarding career, let's say, I, I started knowing nothing, working on the indoor slope. I started to slowly work with... Um, because I was working for Snowzone, 
a lot of brands would come in yeah. and we'd put on events for them. So um, I think it was TSA who had an event, Snowboard Asylum. And at that time I had like, I really wanted to get a sponsor. It's like everyone else was like getting a snowboard for free or whatever. And I thought That sounds cool. This <laughs> is, yeah, I'm going to really try and work towards doing that now because it just seemed that mm. was the way. And um, I think I had a board from TSA, but it wasn't like an official sponsor board. What they used to do is they used to, you could go in there, I think they probably still do it now. If you're looking at a board to buy, at that time it was a battalion and um, they had a lot of sample battalion boards. And um, so what I did is I commandeered one of these sample boards. Sorry, Jez. I, in fact, Jez knows. <laughs> I, I had one of these sample boards. I was using it and there was a competition on. So I thought in my wisdom, I'm going to get a white sheet, cover the top so no one knows what brand this board's on. Because I don't have any sponsors and I'm not trying to let everybody see that I'm riding this blank board, mm. obviously with no brand. Um Rode that in the contest, and me with my unorthodox style, like I always had a trick that nobody else could do. It Big might be my entry level trick that I learned first, but it wasn't the trick that people were learning, so I just bust that out any occasion, <laughs> especially at a contest to try and be like, Yeah, look at me, I got this this one trick. <laughs> but turns out Jez was there, he saw me riding. Obviously, he knows my enthusiasm, he, he see me in and out of the building all the time. And he's looked down at this board, which is totally blank on the top, totally blank on the bottom. He obviously knows what board <laughs> it is. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, Neil, what are you doing riding on that thing? I'm like, that's my board. That's all I got, Jesse. He goes, Monday, go to the shop, get yourself a board. And I was like, yes, <laughs> this is it. I've made it, you know. Like, I think the competition wasn't even at my dome. It was in um, Castleford. So we travelled up to Leeds to do it. It's like one of those things where I just left that place that day feeling like a pro, you know. I felt like, sweet, I'm going to go into the shop Monday. I'm going to pick myself a board. This is the beginning of my snowboarding, the beginning of my career. I'm just jumping in here to tell you about the second sponsor of today's episode, Dry Robe. Dry Robe have been supporting us for a long time and it's great to have them back. Dry Robe is the original outdoor changing robe designed to help you get active outside whatever the weather. A bit like having your own portable changing room, the oversized design of the Dry Robe Advance gives you plenty of space to get changed in and out of a wetsuit or sports kit, but is versatile enough to be worn as a coat or jacket. Made from 100% recycled fabrics, the waterproof and windproof outer protects you from the elements, whilst its super warm inner lining helps you to dry off quickly after getting out of the water. What people really love about the Dry Robe Advance, though, is its versatility. It's perfect for a huge range of outdoor activities, including surfing, wild swimming, triathlon, paddle boarding, mountain biking, camping, and even just walking your dog in the torrential rain. To find out more, head to dryrobe.com. And it's amazing hearing you talk through that, the difference of literally starting to work there, just whatever's happening in the background, but you're you know, welcoming people as they come in, to then fast forward to that moment, you go, there's an opportunity for, for me in this world more yeah. than just being part of the community. Um, and I think one of the things that really stood out to me that you said in the film is, I'm just so grateful to be here. And you often reflect on that journey that you've had and, and look back and think, wow, just really feel that gratefulness. It's only, it's only when I'm doing things like this. Like, I mean, I speak to people all the time. And they're like, oh, so what are you up to? And I'm just like, not much. <laughs> and I, I had it with one of my mates not too long ago. And they were like, what are you talking about? Not much. I've watched your Instagram and you're doing this, 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 this. And, you, and I'm like, well, yeah, I kind of am, <laughs> I but because so. it's happening to me, I don't really feel like it's loads of things. But then when I sit down and I really think about what it is, then, yeah, <laughs> it is a lot sometimes. Um, we're uh, designing snowboards now. We've got shred sleds. We started off with um, these little sleds with a ski underneath. You might have seen them look like a skateboard. They're really good for like just riding around in the mountain. On with shoes on, like you don't need boots or anything like that. Really cool for turning and carving. And then we made the flat ones, which are like a skate deck. 
some more freestyle thing, you know, throw it down in front of you <laughs> and you can hop on a rail or hop on a box or something. They're really fun. You, can, I mean, I had my grandkids just sat on there and pulling them along. <laughs> it's, it's perfect. It's a little sledge. And then um, this year it evolved and we've now gone into using the same sort of graphics that we were using on the sleds, on the snowboards. We've got a range three different boards, a flat board, a cambered board, and a all-round all-terrain board. It's all being sold in TSO, which I'm really grateful for. That's amazing. And then um, I do a lot of social media with Fern Media, a company that another company that I'm involved with. Like uh, the founder is Tom Boddington. He's a guy that I worked with on the indoor slope. Like all of these things have all been built out of this, this community that I the connections I that you found made over the time when I was 20, 20 years ago, you know. And there's lots of influential people in your story. Um, but Claire is one of them. My wife, well. my missus, yeah, yeah. And how important has the role of family been in this journey as well? Yeah, definitely. You know, like I, it's it's been a tough a tough journey. Like it's not easy trying to explain to somebody that you want to go away for four months <laughs> out of. 12 yeah. <laughs> it's like it's not very many months left to spend with me with her sort of thing but um i mean obviously she knew like my full story and what snowboarding had done for me yeah and it's like i said i i almost felt like i owed snowboarding something and it, it sounds a bit weird i suppose but it's only really now which i'm kind of seeing what how I can pay snowboarding back, if that makes sense. But all those years, I was like, yeah, I've got to go to the mountains. I need to do, like, I'll, I strive to find jobs in the mountains that I could do so I could snowboard. Mm. That's how working with the park, shape and stuff all kind of came about because it just meant I was always on the mountain. And, um, yeah, so she's really open-minded. She's like, if that's what you got to do, then kind of that's what you got to do we'll work together like she helped me out loads you know when i'm not there looking after the kids and when i am there making sure that i've got all the kids around me you know just trying to trying to keep that family close as well as build something on the outside which i mean it's not like the it's not like a regular thing you know you might have if i was a footballer earning a couple of million quid a year then it might be something (laughs) different it might have been a lot easier but i was putting a lot of my own in resources into essentially having fun what a lot of people saw it as you know and yeah of course I had a lot of fun but I just saw it as it got me out of a crazy place at 19 20 and now I'm in a lot better place 25 30 I'm not just gonna stop doing it I'm not just gonna be like yeah well that was great now work full-time in an office or something I, ju- I just couldn't see my life doing that but well, I was picking up on what you said about um well I was going to ask you a question around it, you said paying back snowboarding and widening the net for for the snow industry and trying to attract and kind of reach out to people maybe like yourself that didn't know anything about it but actually listening to you talk again in in the documentary it seems like your message is more about finding Encouraging people to find something that they enjoy. It might be it snowboarding, might be, yeah. but it actually might be anything else in, yeah, sure. in life. But find something you enjoy and you can hold on to because that's what's going to help you take you out of a, a difficult place or just set you down a path that, like yourself, you a part, an amazing path that you didn't think you were going to go down, but has, has made you I great. I think ultimately that. that is the key, yeah. Finding something that you enjoy. Anything. I mean... Nobody who's running around the streets doing what some of the kids do, they don't enjoy it. Mm. it. It's not like great fun, happy times. It's a lot of fear, a lot of PTSD, a lot of yeah, it's a lot of anger. It's not, it's not fun. It's not a fun life. It's almost like a necessity sometimes. It's like. It feels like that when you're yeah. when you're in it. Do you know what I mean? But if you're lucky enough to be able to get that break where you can take a step out of it and see it from the outside, you really get to see it for what it is. You really get to see life for what it is. And I was lucky to get that little open door moment where I could look outside the door and be like, 
I want to be out there. I don't want to be in here. Do you know what I mean? And, and and it comes across in the documentary where I say, just find your crowd, find your community, find the thing that you love to do. And it can be football. It can be like the mainstream sports we all get pushed towards when we're young. Or it can be something totally different, something you've never thought of. Taking walks into the wilderness is yeah. somebody's passion. Like it might sound crazy to you, but try it. You never know. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Take a little camping stove and find a trail and just go somewhere. And I think that characteristic that you spoke about earlier about s- taking opportunities when they come to you, like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try that. Yeah, I'll go exactly. and do that. That opens you up to more connections, more opportunities, more experiences, and you just never know what door is going to open in front of you. Yeah, sure. And, and it's amazing to hear your journey and, and you can see it when you're answering the questions and we're just chatting, just the expression of your face of just an amazement of that community that you're in now mm. and just so grateful and thankful for what you're doing now. Just before I ask you for your piece of advice, um, I kind of want to take you, if you ask, to close your eyes and if you put yourself on the mountains now, just to kind of think through, if you're sitting at the top, you know, looking out into that kind of the amazing views, powder underneath and just what are you feeling in that moment when you think about the atmosphere and the views and all of your senses up on the mountains? Um, I've, do you know what? For me, it's just an overwhelming sense of excitement. It's the unknown, going to places that you've never seen, never been before, experiencing like new cultures, new foods, everything. You know, there's mountain resorts in so many far-flung countries some t- you just wouldn't realize like some places in south africa you can go grab a snowboard in where was it somebody was talking to me the other day um turkey you know going to turkey the wow. top of the mountain you can go up there it's only great for a couple of months of the year but <laughs> you know and like there's people in those places that we don't even think about yeah. who are dedicated to this sport, snowboarding, skiing, whatever it is, where they are, you know, and it, it's thinking of things like that that makes me feel like there's there's more to life, essentially, than the little bubble where we've grown up in or we've, it's presented to us on a plate. Sometimes you've got to just get outside of that comfort zone, see what else is out there, because you just never know. You never know what your thing is going to mm. be. Like, you might try five sports and then on the sixth, you'd be like, yeah, that's what I wanted to do. But if you decided to just stick with the first one, you would have never, never realised the people that you meet in all these different places and all these different experiences. God knows where they're going to take you or you're going to take them. Like, it works both ways. Like, I've noticed more and more people, like, even online, on Instagram, will contact me and be like, I saw you snowboarding on this and I thought, yeah, I want to try. And I'm like, what? How did you even see it? I got a friend that I grew up with and it's so funny because now he'll message me and be like, yeah, Neil, I'm going to France to go to this place. What do you reckon? And I'm like, and he was like older than me, you know, back in the day when we were younger. So I kind of looked up to him Mm. and uh, he's just like, yeah, because I saw you do it. Now I've got a group of my mates together and we're going to go and do it. And I just feel like it's it's crazy, overwhelming happiness when people I know, like really know firsthand, come up to me and they're like, yeah, Neil, I saw you do X. I want to do it. And uh, it's one thing when somebody you don't know comes up to you and says it. Yeah. But when somebody that's always been inside your friendship group, always had respect for them. Yeah, up I've to always you. had respect for them. I've always looked up to them and they're like, yeah, what you did was cool. Like, and I have conversations with people now. My son plays football in my local park on a Sunday for a team. Some of the team are friends that I grew up with when I was younger, and they all play together. And they're just like, you can see that they're proud of the fact that I've managed to go do these things that a lot of people didn't think were possible or even didn't know existed. And now, 20 years later, I'm back in the park, same park, cheering my son on and my mates <laughs> at the football you know <laughs> and we have conversations all the time oh we need to go s- on a trip we need to plan a snowball thing you know we need to do this 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 and 
I think it's brilliant. It's great. And and that's how I see now my payback to the snowboarding. Even if it's just me introducing my friends to it or people that know me or people that see me as an, a young black guy, I think, I didn't know black guys did that. I can do that too if he's doing Next it. Next generation. And, th- and there's no reason why not. And that, and that warms my heart when I see somebody like, yeah, I started because I saw you. And it's happened to me more than once. I'm like, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw you at Milton Keynes. And uh, and the conversation come up a few years ago where the black whole uh, Black Lives Matter um, situation was happening. It's still going on. But yeah. and somebody said to me, they didn't realise that black people weren't into skiing or snowboarding because the only place they weren't snowboarding was at Milton Keynes. And I was there every week. So in their mind, well, of course black people yeah. snowboard because well, Neil does it. Yeah. He's there every week. But it, it never really, didn't really make sense to me until afterwards, you know, where you, know, you go to the resort and people might look at you like, oh, look, there's a black guy. You're like, you right? Yeah. And then you start riding and they're like, oh, damn, he can ride as well. <laughs> and you're just like, my mates are like, can you see they're watching you? They're watching you. I'm just like, what? Really? Just Who? doing my what? thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm just, just doing my thing. But it wasn't because it was nothing like derogatory. It was just they'd never seen it before. It was just like something totally new. If we'd have been at football pitch, there would be no surprises if I was playing up front scoring goals. Mm. It would just be like, oh, yeah, that guy's good at football. But I was in the mountains snowboarding. People were like, whoa. But having people like you that never can realized. yeah inspire peers, the next generation, next generation. come along. And now they, like the kids that are going to them same resorts where I went to 20 years ago, felt a bit awkward sometimes, but it was all ultimately always great. Mm. Now when they go, no, no one's even it's looking normal. twice. It's normal. It's normal. Yeah, and you can't go to them resorts and be like, yes, see, I'm the first black guy. No, no, no. <laughs> there was 25 <laughs> guys before you that came here. Do you, like um, My mate works on the trains. And he'd always like, if he sees someone with a snowboard, he's like, oh, my mate snowboards. And my friend Simon, Cy Belson, was on the train once to Farringdon. And this guy, ticket instructor, come up to him. He's like, is that a snowboard? He's like, yeah, yeah, it's a snowboard. He goes, ah, oh, you must know Neil, my mate, he snowboards. He's like, what, Neil Campbell? He's like, yeah, yeah. He's like, yeah, yeah, I know. And it was just like, <laughs> it was just like, What's going super on? weird, you know, like, <laughs> You don't expect to somebody just to know you by name, yeah. but because it's such a small industry and it's snowboarding and and I was the only black guy, not the only black guy at the time, but I was doing my thing yeah. in snowboarding. Like this random person on the train. And Simon rang me straight away. He goes, you will never guess what happened. Some guy on the train <laughs> just, just name dropped you. Blah, blah, blah. I was like, yeah, it's that's one sick. of my mates. <laughs> that's one of my mates I grew up with. You know? <laughs> and, but it's co- funny thing is, that's the same guy who messaged me. like, yep, yeah, I'm going to this place. I'm going to this place oh, now. Right. Yeah, I'm really into it. So it was kind of all made sense in the end. Came around. It was well, sick. Neil, thank you so much for your time. I, I started at the beginning of this podcast giving you Warren's advice. Yes. And now's the opportunity for you. I mean, you've given so much. But to summarise, uh, for, for a piece of advice that I can then pass on to a guest coming Would on that in be the near future. advice about coming onto this podcast or advice it about can be about in absolutely general? anything i've had people give advice about the industry that they're in or what they do um but actually and i've said this before but um one of my favorite came from helen glover who's a, a gb rower and she said she thought for a second and when i was like she's going to come up with some you know, this really inspirational piece of advice and she went if uh, your kids or your grandkids are troubling you and they're all pent up and they need some activity and they need something to do and they're, they're annoying you Tell them to go outside and the first one that finds a snail gets a biscuit. (laughs) (laughs) And I went, that is amazing. (laughs) That is perfect. So to answer your question, it can be about apps. It can be about coming onto this podcast, but it can be about anything at all. Well, that snail thing, I'm going to use that. Definitely. (laughs) That sounds great. Um, My first thing that popped into my head was bring a drink because I don't have one and I would love one. We'll get one afterwards. We'll get you a drink. But I think my first, my piece of advice like generally is... Just be a nice person. Just be a nice person. It's really not that hard. <laughs> like, it, uh, mate, it might might sound crazy, but just be nice to people, man. Just be nice. You get to you people. so so much further in life. You'd be so much happier. That's great advice. And if everybody did it, 
Done, isn't it? World Wars World's sorted. Over. We've sorted the world <laughs> issues just there. Neil, I look forward to passing out on that along. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast featuring my guest, Neil Campbell. An amazing story and to literally hear him talk about the way that snowboarding saved his life. I asked you for a favour at the beginning of the podcast and I continue that. If you haven't shared the podcast with someone who you think would enjoy it just as much as you, then please do. It takes two seconds and it helps more than you can imagine. I'll be back next week with another episode of this podcast and another amazing guest. Until that time, enjoy the outdoors.